Oh, good afternoon. It's uh, it's 2 p.m. UAE time, and uh, welcome to this afternoon's webinar, Planning for the Future, Construction Beyond COVID-19. This webinar is brought to you proudly by Ventures Onsite, the region's leading construction intelligence platform, and in association with the Construction Technology Forum, a Ventures B2B initiative. My name is Phil Higgins, and I will be your host uh, for this afternoon and thank you so much for joining us. Well, in our webinar, in our first webinar on COVID-19 recovery series, we talked about the ripple effect of worldwide lockdown and the economic destruction from the COVID-19 pandemic. We talked about the requirements for long-term stimulation in order for us to move forward, mostly due to the fact this crisis has affected so many industries, not just the construction the construction sector well we're still in this crisis uh, stage of the COVID-19 pandemic but in this webinar we hope to explore what will be required and expected of us as we progress from crisis to recovery we'll speak with several industry leaders to understand the process and the strategies that will be required to keep our business alive and to understand what really will be required for market stimulation. With just two months of lockdowns, the construction industry is already bleeding, even though most of the construction sites have remained open. I moved to the UAE in 2008, just in time for the worldwide economic crisis. And uh, I know firsthand the challenging time back then for many of the construction industries. So should we be expecting a return to the days following the 2008 economic crisis and the 10 years of reform and recovery? Or will 2021 be even more challenging? These are the questions that are on the minds of many in the construction industry. One thing that I learned during this time is that a consequence of less project activity is only fuel for increased competition. And so our question today is, will it be possible to make more with less or is it just enough for us to survive? Well, in the last few weeks, we've heard reports of massive organization and government budget cuts throughout the region that have already filtered down to initial expectations for significant uh, project cost reduction. I, uh, I've been personally involved in a small construction project and last week received a request for a 35% reduction or to accept that this contract would be terminated. This is the sort of expectation that is simply not feasible in the industry. I don't know anyone in the construction sector who makes 35% profit. And if you do know that person, please introduce me. I'd like to, I'd like to meet him and, and hear what his success is. However, market stimulation will require construction cost reduction. And if this is a process driven through competitive ne negotiation to win business, then so be it. Um, no matter what the outcome is, this time will impact all industries at all levels from the architectural consultant through to the raw material supplier. There are so many questions at this time, many of which uh, we simply don't have answers for, but the aim of this webinar is to continue with our commitment to assist the read of the industry and uh, the market developments to provide you the support and advice and understanding as best we can. Today's business now more than ever needs a, a plan for us to survive. The world's economic situation uh, will be reeling from this COVID-19 crisis for many years to come. That is something that I know for sure. The only truth we know is that life as we've known it has changed forever. I think this COVID-19 pandemic will change the way that we interact with people, interact with business, and definitely will interact in, in how we respond. Well, how we respond to this change will determine our continued success our continued success and uh, in this webinar today we hope that we can share a little of what that success uh, can look like. 
Well, joining us today is a panel of industry leaders, and I'd like to introduce them to you. First, we have the, the Senior Vice President of uh, Keo Consulting, Mr. Clive de Villiers. Clive, thanks for joining us. You were a part of our first webinar, and uh, we really appreciated your input, so we look forward to hearing from you. Um, we have the, the Business Continuity and Risk Management Specialist at Ventures Middle East, Mr. Marwan Aldo. We have the Managing Director of Analytica Solutions, a subsidiary of ASGC Group of Companies, Mr. M Mr. Majid al Hawari, And uh, we have the Group Business Development Manager of Kansab, Mr. Jonathan, Jonathan Everly. Jonathan, thanks for, for joining us today. We've got the Managing Director of Amana Contracting, Mr. Riyad Sabes. Riyad joined us for our first webinar, and, uh, and I've been very impressed with, this, with, this, with his company's proactive measures taken to, uh, to support his employees and the continuity of construction. So look forward to uh, hearing from you later, Riyad. We've got the General Manager of BK Golf, Mr. Bashir Massad. I interviewed Mr. Bashir at the Big Five last year, and. Uh, a great speaker, a man passionate for his business, and so we, uh, we thank you for joining us today. Um, the general manager from Voltas in Qatar, Mr. D.S. Murthy. Mr. Murthy, thank you for joining us. All the way from his lockdown in the USA, we have the architectural advisory manager of Golf Glass Industries, Mr. Kirk Russell. This is the longest holiday you've ever had, Kirk, so uh, uh, we look forward to hearing a little bit of your story uh, today. So uh, thanks for joining us, and we hope you didn't have to get out of bed too early. We've got the regional director from Bin Musa and Daly, and uh, a man who uh, has very quickly became a good friend. He's that sort of person, Mr. Luke Daly. Luke, thanks for joining us. We added one more section to our discussion today, um, and uh, because, uh, I mean, this, this, uh, this COVID-19 pandemic has really driven business in a new direction, and we look forward to hearing from Mr. Mohammed Nagi, he would probably be the most passionate man I know on the face of, on the, on the face of this earth for digitization in business. He is the digitization and BM manager of Analytica Management Solutions. Mohammed, we, we look forward to, uh, to you joining us. In fact, uh, we originally decided not to uh, share video in, uh, in, this, uh, in this webinar, as we've done in the past. Um, there's always been some issues or concerns, but uh, one thing that we have seen in the last couple of months is a uh, dramatic improvement in the platform for webinars and uh, our visual communications as this is. And uh, maybe uh, Mr. Mohammed can add some comment to that later on today. Well, so let's keep moving ahead and we're gonna go straight over to Mr. Marwan. Marwan, Marwan is a risk management specialist and joined us in our first webinar. I gave him a task to bring us some introductions to what's happening in the risk management of our business. And uh, that, of course, sort of bleeds into the finance sector. Marwan, in, in our first webinar, you spoke of the ripple effect due to the worldwide economic uh, shutdown that we've seen across the industries. Do you have any updates on, on this subject uh, for us to hear? Uh, yes, definitely. Hi, Phil. Uh, good to be back. Hope every everyone's doing well. Um, so the updates is that uh, it's, it's, it's the same as, as last time. Uh, the pandemic has, has presented us with a range of challenges for the construction and energy uh, and engineering sorry, industry. Uh, but but it's it's looking uh, better from a financial point of view, from the banks and liquidity uh, aspect. In, in my introduction, I drew some connection to the worldwide economic crisis that we experienced in two thousand and eight. Um, I recall back then that there uh, it, there was a very difficult time for the construction sector. Are we looking at um, something the same as that as we move forward, or? Is this going to be worse or different? What's what's your take on this? Uh, my my take on that is is it's not going to be as bad as as that. Uh, let me start. So before two thousand eight two thousand nine crisis, we had seen uh, less strict regulations regarding the sector financing, and what happened after two thousand eight two thousand nine crisis resulted in more rigid and strict regulatory controls. 
specifically and targeted uh, the construction and engineering industry. Um, this reflected on the ability to be granted the liquidity needed from the banks, which has caused um, a lot of, of, of financial troubles to, to the companies that are operating in this uh, industry. Now, um, it's not as bad as that, I would say, because basically uh, I have looked and spoken to uh, banking and investment bankers, uh, experts. So uh, the way they're looking after uh, for post-COVID-19 is that they have devised the matrix of, of lending for uh, all industries uh, that would look at every company, uh, regardless of the of the industry that they're operating in, and, and more into the company company's financial situation itself. So uh, this this matrix that they're using it's it's a bit of a complex matrix, but they call it the triad matrix approach. Um, I would like to highlight two key points that that relate to the construction and engineering industry which is that there's two key aspects in this matrix that will uh, basically uh, your financing and liquidity and loans from the banks in the future will be dependent on. One is the pre-existing credit score for your, for your company pre-COVID-19. And that's something that we cannot change right now. The second aspect is what have you done in Q1, Q2, and 2020 in terms of cash flow, effective cost management, balance sheets, PNLs. So if, if you take any conclusion from the financial industry uh, or the banks uh, basically financing in the future the construction engineering industry, uh, you should just take these two notes and focus on showing what have you done as financial crisis management uh, during COVID-19, which in, in, in summary, will will be split into four main pillars, which is cash flow management, cost management, continuous scenario modeling, and corona aid relief evaluation. Uh, that's basically uh, continuously watching for the stimulus uh, provided by the uh, by the government or the state or, or the federal level of the country you are operating in. So it's going to be very important what, what the client has done, what the company has done, you know, during this, 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 uh, this process of recovery. Definitely. Definitely. And that's a global thing. It's not only applicable to, to, to the UAE. Uh, so basically we cannot do anything about our credit score for 20, 2019, for example. However, we can do a lot about showing the bank, uh, that we, we, we have taken the important steps and we have continuously been monitoring and effectively uh, managing uh, multiple scenarios, uh, managing the cash flow, uh, monitoring cost, uh, taking the most cost effective approaches, uh, working closely with the subcontractors, with the regulators, with the uh, basically uh, the governments and the clients that have commissioned uh, earlier projects that have already been signed all of that will make a difference. So that's what I would focus on. Very good. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, let's keep moving along because we have, some, uh, we have some great support today from people that are within the construction sector. So we, uh, we know that the construction activity is continuing throughout the marketplace, but, uh, but we, have seen, um, we have seen some lockdown in, in the cities, which has made the office activity difficult. We've, we've seen a lot of health and safety requirements being put in place on the building sites. Riyad, maybe could you, could, you, could you please bring us an update as to what's happening on the construction activity today? What are some of the requirements that you have to employ as you uh, continue your business activity? Uh, sure. Um, and this has been the case. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Uh, th sorry, thank you, Philip, for the uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, this has been the case for the last uh, few weeks. Uh, so social distancing is needed on sites. So we've been ensuring that in our buses and our equipment, uh, um, people moving back and forth to the sites, the spacing of people on sites as much as possible. Uh, in the offices, we've been maintaining between 10 to 20% of our office staff in the office. The rest are working from home. We've been able to everyone on Teams uh, since uh, almost a month and a half ago uh, to work from home. 
Um, so needless to say, productivity has been impacted at site. Uh, progress is impacted, obviously, at site. Uh, from a uh, protection point of view, uh, we've been sanitizing our buses, you know, before and every trip, uh, our, our, our camps and accommodations uh, two to three times a, 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 a day. Uh, we have heat cameras and, and heat sensors in all our sites and offices. So all the usual measures that many, if not most, or majority of contractors are doing today. So this is all, all, all in place. But what we realize, the silver lining is our ability to continue to function, you know, while we're not physically together in the same offices. So right. that is it's, right. it's like a silver lining for us. Very good, very good. How's the situation for you, uh, Jonathan? So how's the market responsive activity? In- uh, well, sorry, Philip, to start with, Kansai only operates in the UAE. We're not, oh, we're not a Qatar-based uh, company. Um, but from... Our point of view, I'd have to say, we've tried to continue business as best we can. I mean, it's been it's been extremely difficult. We had some things up extremely well. I think there was a period at the beginning of the lockdown where, uh, in terms of construction activity, we were fairly optimistic in terms of productivity levels and continuing um, with projects at a, at a reasonably efficient level. We, we for the first week or so first couple of weeks probably felt that we were operating at somewhere between 70 to 80 percent efficiency um in truth that's dropped i mean inevitably it's dropped with the increase um restrictions and measures that were brought in a couple of weeks ago um and, and again difficult to say but we're probably working at somewhere in excess of 50 to 60 percent efficiency at the moment um so that's from a site point of view i think in terms of all the health um, measures that we are taking they mirror um, what Riyadh explained from Amana's point of view, so we're doing pretty much exactly the same. Um, and, you know, to be perfectly honest, I think priority number one has to be um, the health and safety and welfare of uh, everybody employed in the company. So that's that's the place we start from. Um, the second part I would probably touch on is the working from home thing. I guess across the board, everybody has been surprised and pleasantly surprised at how... Um, relatively easy it's been to convert to this pretty much full-time working from home situation i think the technology as you alluded to has improved significantly i think people are genuinely committed to working from home um, operations whether that means teams meetings or more phone calls Um, it it brings its own um, challenges i think you've got to make more of an effort to remain in contact not only externally with your clients and consultants that happens obviously more easily when there are specific project meetings that are set up but i think outside of those you've actually got to go out of your way to maintain contact with people on a on a casual basis and probably even more significantly on an internal basis keeping in touch with your staff and particularly those staff who are not necessarily going to be involved in the regular um weekly or whatever they may be project type discussions so I think there's an onus on making sure from a management point of view that you keep staff engaged, keep, keep communicating with them, um, check out their okay from a, a mental point of view, because I think that, that working from home, um, lack of interpersonal contact, if that's the way of putting it, is, is, is important as well. People are going to be missing out on that. So there's a number, a number of things that working from home brings in terms of challenge, but I think our view is that it's really opened our eyes to a much more potentially efficient way of working um, and I don't think for one minute anybody's expecting to keep on working in the way that we're doing it at the moment on a, we call it a 100% basis but there's probably a happy medium there somewhere and each company's got to find its own its own balance of course but I think from an efficiency point of view um, less traveling less commuting less wasted time waiting for meetings you know there's a whole host of advantages to it very good um, Majid, are you with us? Majid, uh, how are you finding uh, new project discussion? Is is there uh, tenders that are being released? Uh, are there projects that are coming uh, coming up for discussion that are new? Or is everyone just simply focused on the current uh, construction activity? Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation and being with you today here. I think for the time being, the prime concentration for everyone is to keep the business uh, moving. Uh, ongoing projects and projects just 
kicked off recently to, to try to keep as much as we can on the track. Uh, new discussion for the new business, I think it's a little bit moving uh, uh, much slower than before, just to make sure that the current situation is going to pass safely. The concentration of uh, safety and business continuity is the, the, the primary focus of everyone now. While tendering, you know, that normally at, at this stage of every year being in Ramadan and then approaching the summer timing and such things. So this is uh, almost every year a slow season, mm. which I mean, fortunately happened during the corona. So it will not be like a, a double a double impact to what's happening in the market. So from the existing projects that you're working on, are you seeing clients come to you already with some requests for price reductions? Or is this something that, that will only develop as we progress with new project tenderings? I, I, I think for ongoing projects, it's too early to discuss this one because there is contractual obligations for everyone. Even if the client comes and asks for this one, it, uh, there is a framework agreement and the cont uh, 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 contractual obligations for everyone in the, uh, in the, in the country. Uh, maybe for the, the, the future projects and uh, uh, is it going to be a cost reduction or the cost is going to be much higher due to the impact of the supply chain, the international supply chain, the delays happening for the delivery of material and some other basic requirements from outside. So it could work on both ways. So since things are not yet clear, clearly defined at this stage, I think by end of Q2, everything is going to be clear what's going to happen. So from my point of view, it's too early to discuss any cost reduction or associated cost or uh, uh, extra cost. It's something a little bit too early at this stage. Is that the same for the other panelists? Uh, Riyadh, are you seeing uh, pressures being put on, on the pricing sector within the, within the marketplace? No. I, I agree with Maggie, no, with existing contracts, not really, no, because uh, there are existing contracts and clauses and, and frankly, you cannot get any discount, you cannot obtain any discount on the cost if you're, you know, halfway or 80% of a project, you know, it's, uh, so that's, that's physically not possible. And then for new projects, I can expect fierce competition in the market, but I would not expect drops of 20 and 30%. And if they happen, they're going to be in, only in one cycle, of a, a one tender cycle because there might be some players that would want to, from, from a cash point of view, secure projects, but that cannot sustain itself. So just like in 08, 09, 10, uh, there were some severe cuts, let's say, in the costs initially, but then eventually things catch up. So I support Maggie with this point on supply chain. Today, there's a trade-off between supply chain where the lowest cost could be coming from China, but then you also have to balance that against the agility of your supply chain and sustainability. So do you buy from, for example, a local manufacturer that might be more expensive than China, knowing that if there's a lockdown, you can continue to get the supply, or do you buy it from across the globe and, 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 and risk uh, the, the uh, ability to get the material in place? So I think there's more, more than just the cost of it. Now, whether the industry will become more efficient, I absolutely agree. We will find ways to become more efficient, but I doubt we will reach cuts of 20, 30, 40% unless if the whole industry fundamentally changes itself. Uh, and then we can talk about this point more if you'd like, but, uh, uh, but there has to be fundamental changes in the way we construct the built environment to reach those kinds of, of reductions in costs. I, ha I had some interesting discussion with uh, Clive de Villiers uh, earlier with regard to uh, the, the developers' interaction with market. And uh, he, he was saying that he was explaining that developers, while well, they've put a lot of things on hold right now, they, uh, they, they are willing to move forward, but may well see this as a time of opportunity for them where developers will continue to develop, but will be looking for, for financial support to, to build their building at a lower cost. I, I know from my time back in 2008 when there were less projects and that's, that, 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 that's definitely going to be the case as we move forward. Where there are less, less products, there is increased competition. And when you have con a construction sector that has been uh, bleeding, then you will see very fierce competition. And in some supply sectors, that could mean uh, you know, considerable price reduction. Um, some manufacturers may find themselves working at uh, 
being prepared to accept orders at variable cost just to cover their, their materials and, and their overhead where other companies are buying and reselling like the distributor. And in, in our next step, we, we will discuss this with some of the contractors. Um, but how do you see um, as the, the, the way that we, I mean, in, in order for the construction sector to receive stimulation and to move forward, there has to be some support financially. There has to be some, some incentive for the developer to be investing. Um, where do you think some of that, that, that cost down will come? Will it be from efficiencies in, in, the, uh, in the business activity? Jonathan, maybe you could answer that one for us. Yeah, I think inevitably moving forward, there's going to, there's going to be a need for greater efficiency. I think, again, we had um, touched on that. I think we all agree that the industry will need to become more efficient, efficient in, in the way it goes about its business. I think any expectation of uh, either renegotiating current projects um, at lower prices is, is just just not going to happen. We're not seeing any, any of that at the moment. I think there is a commitment there on existing work. The only concern probably with existing work is whether the contracts actually proceed or not. Um, but to expect any price redu reductions on them is, is probably not going to be realistic. New work, again, if I'm being honest, I think any expectation, as we have just mentioned, to be, to be reducing costs by 10, 20, 30 percent, it's just mm. not going to happen because the market is in such a competitive position anyway. I think the significant difference between what we're seeing and what we're com coming out of now versus what we saw in 2008 is that the industry had come through some reasonably good years ahead of or prior to the 2008 um, GFC and therefore probably had a little bit more fat on some of its ongoing contracts, a little maybe more reserves to fall back on. Um, the market that we're operating in now has been so competitive now for a number of years. I just don't think those margins are there um, to be to be expecting contractors to be to be to be cutting their costs. Now, efficiency and, and finding new ways of working as we move forward is probably what the industry needs anyway. The only thing I would add to that is it needs to be a two-way street. I mean, there are, there are lots of efficiencies that can be gained with things like modularization, um, certainly the use of technology, whether it's BIM or um, through some of the design phases. Um, we'd like to be doing a lot more off-site um, fabrication type operations, whether that's MEP installation uh, or products. There's a little bit of it going on at the moment, things like bathroom pods. Obviously, precast has been done for quite some while, but there's so far that the industry could go in terms of modularization. Um, but it's a two-way street. It needs a lot more buy-in from the authorities. Um, contractors will will up their game without a shadow of a doubt to be able to do it, but it does need that um, collaborative approach between the whole of the uh, the industry, really, designers and, and clients uh, and the authorities, the approval authorities. Mm, very good. I'm talking about uh, technology. Mr. Clive de Villiers has finally joined us. So thanks, Clive, for joining us. We'll, we'll go to you in a, in a minute. But uh, just a question, with, with, with support for the construction industry moving forward, do you... Do you think that there'll be some leniency in some of the contract bonds that were being expected uh, on construction projects? Is there any, is there, has there been any discussions with developers and financiers in this, in, in the financing support for the construction of a project? Majid, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I think that during April, most of the stakeholders start to discuss together what's going to happen in terms of the finance. As everyone knows, the, the first one is suffering for the time being at the main contractor and along with his full supply chain. We, we, we cannot say that anything is the agreed yet between different key players. I, even I was checking with our, uh, our uh, friends in the industry across in the region, the JCC and even in the Middle East still discussing with the clients and the different uh, project owners, but we didn't reach, no one reached to any clear vision now what's going to happen. Very still, good. it's a, it's a very gray area. Everyone is looking to the best for his benefit and client want to complete his project. Contractor want to reduce the risk as in the first one is exposed with the what happening, what's happening now with the, like uh, in some projects, few thousands of labor, they are getting paid daily, transported daily and all this. Client has the commitment 
uh, to deliver projects to secure his the cash in. Meanwhile, even the end user, some end users start to have the same discussion with the client about postponing or reducing or getting a discount for their installments. So still at early stage. Well, so I, 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 think, I, I think it's just, you know, uh, a great tribute to the, the government in the UAE and other regions that have supported a lot of the construction sites to remain open uh, during this time. Um, yes, there's been some restrictions, but uh, there's been every effort to keep, to keep the ball rolling. And so uh, that's healthy for those construction companies that have uh, work in progress. And so we thank you, uh, gentlemen, for your time uh, this afternoon. We thank you for your input. And uh, we, we, do, we do hope that your construction process remains safe and ongoing. I'd like to hook over to Mr. Clive de Villiers. Clive, thanks for finally joining us. Sorry, you had, a bit of, you had a bit of a technical issue there, but uh, um, we, uh, we're, we're so glad you're here. Thanks, uh, thanks, for, thanks for being a part of our webinar again today. Um, I, I'd like to hand over to you, Clive. Just, uh, I know that you have very strong, close connection to many developers in the industry today. Could you just give us some, uh, an update as to what they're saying today? What are their expectations? Well, I'd just like to step back for a second. You were talking about the bonds. Um, yes. I'm not too sure which direction you were going there, but in terms of performance bonds, those always stay and they always will stay. Maybe bid bonds are no longer required or reduced, but performance bonds will always be there from, uh, uh, from the client side. Every contractor would be required to uh, provide his performance bond. There's never going to be a reprieve on that. During the heydays in 2007, 2008, um, bid bonds were just were just forgotten about. There, there was so much work around um, that contractors just said, "Listen, if you want me to bid, I'm not, you know I'm not interested. I've got three or four bids lying on my desk. If you want a bid bond, forget it. You know I'll give you a bid, but no bond. Bid bond. Of course, a performance bond was always required. So, oh, very yeah. good, good, very yes. good input. So, what are the developers yeah. saying today? What what's some of the feedback from the market that you're hearing? <laughs> Well, in, in Saudi, which is where, where the major part of our focus is, it's um, it, it just it's moving slowly at the moment. Um, but I think things are, are are sort of stacking up a little bit, um, and things are going. To, I, I think when the curtain is lifted, that there will be more of a movement. We we are still bidding all the time uh, with some of the bigger developers. Uh, and in fact, just this morning, we submit, sent through another, through another uh, bid in, in Riyadh itself. So, um, you know, a, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of them are still going ahead. And, but I think we will only really see uh, awards, I don't, I don't know, maybe in the next month or two months or three months maybe. But uh, the, 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 uh, the work will still go on, certainly in Saudi. Um, the UAE seems to be extremely quiet. I, I see you've got Jonathan uh, on, on, the, uh, on the call today. I haven't seen him for a few years. Um, he would probably know more about the UAE than me. Uh, Kuwait, Kuwait, the developers are active, um, but more in the government or semi-government uh, uh, sector. Uh, Bahrain is dead. Um, Qatar is moving in the government sector, very active. Uh, Oman is quiet. That's, that's my, my experience with the developers we're working with. There was a question from our first webinar that was very specific to the, to the mega projects that were announced last year in Saudi Arabia. And there was con concern as um, whether this would be, um, whether this would be, uh, whether we would see ongoing process uh, or pro progress on those major sites. Have you, have you heard anything specific to, uh, to, to some of those projects? Yeah, there are, there are some of the, the bigger ones that are sort of seem to be on hold. Nobody's admitting they're on hold. Uh, there seems to be a focus in certain areas only. For example, Kadir seems to be going ahead. Uh, and there are certain other ones within downtown Riyadh as well. But then there are others, uh, other, some of the real mega ones that seem to have uh, just stifled a little bit. You know, they still have the team of consultants on board and PMOs. They're all ready to roll but nothing's actually happened on, on, on any of those projects. So yes, there's, there's sort of selection, there's selection of, of uh, uh, scope there. Yeah, certain of the developers, yes, others, no, on, on hold at the minute. We've seen, we've seen in project design uh, in the last few years, a lot of development of 
uh, sustainable management of the building. We've seen, uh, you know, the use of improved glass technologies, which is from my industry background. Um, we've seen you know, a, a lot of a, a lot of focus on sustainability, but we we also understand that that has a, a co adds significant cost to the project. I mean, as we as we move forward in this recovery, uh, is, uh, do do you feel that the developers and the architectural designers will still have this this focus on on the quality of our construction process? In, 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 again, in terms of Saudi King Salman, uh, sorry, uh, uh, MBS, as Mohammed bin Salman, um, has basically set out the criteria to say that in, in, he's looking for smart city development. He doesn't want just the same old, same old. He wants a smart city development and yeah. sustainability. Oh, yeah, it's big, big business, in, certainly in uh, KSA. Uh, it's not what always what the consultant proposes. It's what's within the RFPs. They basically say, this is the standard we need. And if you can't fit that, then, you know, don't bid. So certainly, can you say yes? Many of our many of our viewers today are from the manufacturing sector. I'm sure they manufacture products that uh, are presented to architects for specification and uh, and, uh, and and in for uh, for supply approval. Um, I'm sure you know many of them and have met me many of them. Um, at this time. Uh, do, do you do you feel that this is uh, a good time to be connecting with consultants to be presenting their products? Are architects working and 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 uh, and uh, being involved with the uh, with the, the 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 specification process today? I think it's always a good time for consultants to uh, to, uh, to connect up with consultants um, uh, in in whatever form it is. Um, yes, yes, it's always a good time. I mean, and. Uh, we, and from the consultant side, we're always looking for new products too. We have certain designers from the US that we are working with that have come with some outlandish type of ideas and designs and, and we are scratching around, running around, trying to find, find um, manufacturers that can develop some of these schemes that they've got. Uh, so yes, it, it's always a good time to be knocking on the doors, always. I've always been impressed with the uh, the, the team at Keo, uh, your company, uh, uh, having you know represented products that need specification for many years, um, the the architectural team there at Keo have always been uh, enthusiastic to adopt new technologies and new quality products, and so uh, I, I'm sure that that's one of the reasons for your continued success. Just just just, just to give you another example on this project we're doing in uh, Riyadh, we have light fixtures, up lighters that are being specified out of the UK. They are horrendously expensive. And the client just turned around and said to us, and us as the cost consultant, he said, hey, I need something cheaper. Do you think I can find anything cheaper? Um, there seems to be a dearth of, of um, manufacturers. So are there any suppliers out there that are listening in? Gee, I'd love, I'd love to talk to you if you've got some uh, uplighters that are manufactured somewhere else. Probably not China, though. <laughs> but do you, but, but, I mean, that's, a, that's an example of something that I think that you may be faced with from the developer. Um, as we move forward, this is expensive. Do you have a lower cost option? I mean, we've, we've been calling it value engineering for the last few years. It's not really value engineering, but it, it, is there going to be a focus from the developer for a lower cost through product selection? They, they certainly want to look at other other items. They don't want just a sole source. They want to see two or three options, and then they will go forward and select it. Um, and what's well, certainly what Saudi are doing is they saying right if we develop in this area and then we're going to go to the next area we want to ensure that uh, the, the facility maintenance have we got the same type of fixture or whatever it may be so uh, you know if we've got a shed full of these spares it'll fit in that that area there and fit in this area in there yeah, very good uh, so any, any guy that developer that builds a, a building he's not going to put in and he's got two or three buildings on a project he's probably going to keep the same elevators for example whatever the brand name may be so when it comes to O&M, he can uh, economize. Yeah. So very good. So no, they're not always looking for cheaper. They're just looking for alternatives. That's that's what it really is. So, I mean, they don't believe the first number that is presented to them. Clive, thanks for joining us today. I know you're a very busy man, but uh, it's good to hear your voice. Sure. And uh, and um, um, we're 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 honoured that you can join us. So very much appreciate your time. I'd like to move over to our subcontractors and suppliers. Uh, we have Mr. Bashir, Mr. Murthy, Mr. Luke, and Mr. Kirk. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, Kirk, thanks for joining us from the USA. How's, that, how's everything over there? Good afternoon. 
Um, it's a little bit early over here. It's uh, coming up on, uh, on six o'clock in the morning. Um, but, uh, but it's good. It's good to see you all. Kirk, yeah, I, know that, I, know you, I know that you've been there in the, U, in the U.S., but you're still working for a UAE-based company, and uh, it's the ultimate remote sort of uh, r- remote connection yes. for, for you. Um, how's, yeah. how's the market in general for golf, golf glass industries? Well, I, you know, there, there's a there's a lot of sustain. I mean, we were we were very prudent in the uh, uh, in the in the, the, the years and months leading up to um, uh, to to January. Um, we were very careful about making sure that we were able to keep our our promises uh, and uh, keep everybody afloat. So we're 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 quite we're quite stable that way. Um, the uh, we haven't been hit too hard with it. Um, collections are good, and um, and our our uh, our relationships are good. So, so the so the work uh, we're, we're the workload the workload in your factory is uh, ongoing. Is it is it the same as before? Well, it, 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 yeah, it, it, of course we're we're impacted by it, but we're we're still able to uh, uh, respond to what 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 we've contracted to do. So that's that's just fine. We're being very prudent with our people as well. We've got to make sure because those that's the, the real strength of what, what it is that we do. We've got a lot of brain power there and a lot of skill there. And we're, we're trying to make sure that, that they're safe um, and that we're, work, we're working through this uh, as safely as possible. Very good, very good. How's, uh, how's the market there for you, Mr. Bashir? How's BK Golf doing uh, in your business activity? Maybe you could just give us a, a very brief uh, update as to, to what, what your company does and what you're seeing in the marketplace today. Good afternoon, Phil. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for, ha- for having me with you today. Again, uh, I, I wish in this holy month of Ramadan that you are keeping safe and all the audiences and in good health. That's the most important thing in this, uh, in this time. Um, um, the, I, I would like to start with, with, a, with a positive note although it is challenging time, uh, by saying that, that we, are, we are probably uh, blessed to be in the, the construction sector or construction market in, the, in this region. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, the UAE and, uh, and many countries within the region uh, classed the construction industry as, as a vital sector, which is very important. So they put us in the same level of security, energy, uh, so at least we, we, we are still going ahead, and, and that's that's uh, really a positive a positive uh, thing to to have. Um, the MEP sector is obviously part of a supply chain within that construction sector. We are normally at uh, tier two or tier three tier three within 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 the supply chain. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, we are probably the most significant and perhaps the most complex part uh, of that supply chain, I would say, um, uh, as MEP subcontractors. This means that we are also exposed to the highest level of risk um, uh, within, that, uh, within that chain and among our uh, stake- stakeholders. Uh, I know we're talking about planning for the future, but for me, uh, if we need to talk about the future, we need to also talk about the present and, and the past. So if you allow me, I would to talk about before COVID, during COVID, and after COVID for the MEP uh, industry, because the, the, the future is only a reflection of, of what we do today and what we have done in the past. The MEP industry or sector is already, in my opinion, was under 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 a tremendous amount of risk uh, uh, and and evolving even before uh, uh, the current uh, pandemic situation. Um, uh, simply because the, the risks associated with the with the with the construction business and in particular the MEP business is is significant. Whether it's program related, uh, efficiency related, productivity, and most more more important financial risks. Uh, that has started before COVID, and it is increasingly, uh, you know, incre- increasingly now increasing uh, a big time during the COVID time. Uh, if you ask me about uh, 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 how my expectations for the future, uh, obviously after COVID will be nothing uh, uh, 
like what we have seen before. I don't think it's it's comparable to, to the 2008. I think it's going to be challenging. Uh, the MEB uh, uh, business, uh, we will see, I think, different models of uh, procurement of MEB. I think a lot of companies will... Uh, uh, Will 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 go to integrated models of delivery, uh, in-house delivery, um, uh, instead of uh, procuring standalone MEP. So so it's an opinion. Again, I think a lot of the MEP companies who are who are not part of a, a larger group of companies which provides support, different kinds of support, will struggle. Uh, however. The, the 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 skill base and the importance of the MAP will remain. So, I see movement from uh, MAP subcontracting as we see it today to what I call uh, um, an MAP resource pool or skill base that will be utilized in different formats. This will uh, change. This this of course will change that whole construction process. Uh, uh, MEP is a major portion of the business activity. Very good point. Uh, of course, uh, but but on a, on a, again on a positive note, MEP is is the most. I mean, is is one of the most important parts of of the construction supply chain. Uh, uh, the skill base of MEP is very important. Uh, I think companies who, who invest in, in in diversification and in innovation. Uh, Jonathan mentioned about uh, prefabrication and other ideas. Uh, I think uh, uh, there will be opportunities for, for, for these uh, organizations uh, going forward. Um, uh, although uh, the, the, you mentioned uh, price, prices will be stressed, uh, the competition will, will probably increase, but, uh, but uh, mm-hmm. as, as we have risks, I'm sure we will have opportunities in the future Very for good. people yeah. who can sustain themselves within this uh, challenging time. Very good, very good. Mr. Murthy, how are you finding the market in Qatar? Is that a similar sort of update for you there? Uh, in Qatar, we are having projects running just like the rest of the GCC. We have the projects which are important for the, for the government of Qatar, specifically connected to FIFA. Uh, they are progressing uh, well. They are going on. Uh, we had, uh, before Ramadan, we had six hour working for other projects, but now after Ramadan, it's all uh, it's, it's uniform kind of stuff. And major projects which are coming up are going on in full swing. Uh, other than that, uh, whether the award of projects, I heard a lot of people talking about whether awards are taking place or not. Uh, just today in the morning, for example, I heard one of the projects was awarded to a main contractor. So I think Qatar is moving in the direction of uh, continuing its, its, its progress or its uh, its direction, the way it wants to go to meet the FIFA 2022 uh, requirements. This is, this is still this is still a focus for the entire construction sector today. So it is it is it is going on well. It is uh, it is going on in the direction. Yes, all measures are being taken to ensure the safety, the health, the welfare of the workers, the staff, the entire workforce itself, uh, because that is of prime consideration. I mean, come on, let's be honest. That is the first and foremost important thing anywhere in the world. Uh, COVID is affecting everybody else, so surely the supply chain will also be affected. Uh, as far as the price reductions, etc., the discussion that I have heard, uh, I tend to agree that I do not believe uh, any price reduction of 10, 15, 20, 30, that's all wishful thinking, whether it's a developer or the main contractor or anybody else, those kind of margins are simply not there in the construction industry. Uh, to expect that this will happen uh, is, is a no go. Maybe, maybe we should we should just call that fake news or something. Uh, there's a there's a lot of that discussion around. I know that uh, some suppliers. I'd like to hand over to, to Luke just now because I did have some discussion with Luke earlier on this. Luke, we've heard the construction. Bell? Yes, we heard we we heard from the construction sector that you know there are contractual restrictions and price reductions can't be necessary. But you're a supplier of product. You're a distributor, I guess. You, you buy from, you're, you're a representative of some very well-respected international brands. Um, are, are you seeing, you know, your prices being held in the marketplace? Well, yeah. To start with, I'd echo the sentiments by a lot of the contractors who have been speaking earlier that, you know, 20, 30% price reductions simply won't be achievable. 
Uh, I mean, from the manu manufacturer's perspective and us as a distributor, everyone knows that you have to tighten your belt to enter the UAE construction market anyway. And there simply isn't the room to offer those kinds of price reductions. But just to, you know, in terms of how it's going at the moment, we've actually, we haven't seen a big downturn in sales so far in April. Uh, in fact, a lot of the project sites have been asking for more material. You know, I assume trying to stick to their deadlines and finish off projects as fast as they can. So what we may start to see though is a dip in the coming months. We could have supply coming in from Europe being affected. Certainly there, there are less ships going between Europe and also from the Far East. Uh, we've also noted increased shipping costs, sometimes between 30 to 60% increases in uh, containers which we're looking to bring in over the next few months. So, you know, that's another reason why these sort of price reductions, certainly in the short term, I don't think will be feasible. So, so, we, so we might see, uh, we might see Binbusa and Daly UAE manufactured pumps down the road or is, do you think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there could be a much greater emphasis on uh, locally manufactured products in the future. That'd be interesting to hear other people's insights on that. But, you know, certainly assurance of supply will be a major factor for some contractors, I'm sure. Do you think that this concern is what's been driving your demand in, in the last couple of weeks? I know you've been a very difficult yes. to get a hold of. Uh, you've been busy. <laughs> yeah, we have been busy. Thankfully, we were exempted uh, being, a supply, being part of the supply chain for the construction sector. We are exempted from the recent lockdown. Uh, so we are allowed 30% of our staff in work. But yeah, it has been busy. You know, A lot of the projects seem to be pushing ahead wanting material fast, you know, we haven't been able to keep up in some cases. So yeah, it has been a busy month, but you know, who knows what's to come in the next two months. As I said, supply could be affected if we have delayed containers coming in from Europe, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, it will be interesting to see. I guess one of the advantages for the construction sector is that it does take some time to build a building. And uh, if we have, you know, several projects in hand, then there is a there is a timeline of various products supplied to those projects, and various industry sectors will be busy at certain times. You know the advantage of of keeping our construction sites open um, has uh, has been a great support for the subcontractors and the suppliers of products, and uh, we hope that this will continue. I I don't think it would be I don't think it's just something that is for now and next month. I mean, for that reason, the, con the construction process is ongoing and it's not that we build a building in two weeks and then we move on to the next one. There is continuity of that supply. So I think, uh, I think that there is you know, tremendous opportunity for us to keep moving forward. It may not be at the same pace as it's been, but uh, it will definitely, there will definitely be some pace. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Um, I want to move over to Mr. Uh, move on to Mr. Muhammad Nagi, the, the the man of digitization. Muhammad is uh, is a very interesting, very enthusiastic man. I, I, I interviewed him also at the Big Five last year and uh, met with him through the Construction Technology Forum, who, by the way, are a, a an associated uh, supporter of this webinar. Um, Construction Technology Forum have their own webinar coming up on the 13th of April. Um, and uh, I'm sure that you'll be kept informed where they are, they will be dedicating, we will be dedicating a webinar specific to the technical de developments of this space, the digitization and technical performance within the construction sector. So Mohammed, thank you for joining us. How are you doing? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Philip, for the, uh, uh, yeah, the, the enthusiastic uh, introduction. Uh, I'm all good working remotely, so uh, I'm trying to practice the, uh, or I'm trying to test the, the digital environment that we were setting up in the past period, so. Fantastic. Yeah. So with so much attention to low cost stimulation and uh, with, you know, business moving forward, construction activity, what are you seeing in your space in this area of uh, digital efficiency within the construction process? Do you have any very interesting updates that you could bring to us that you've seen as that has that have maybe evolved or progressed significantly in the last couple of months during this time of uh, of change for us? 
So um, let me start by saying that uh, in the past month, we have seen how different industries have reacted to uh, the lockdown and what was happening and the need for remote working and then the need to um, try to maintain efficiency and productivity while uh, working in um, um, a severely new situation or a severely new environment. So um, I think uh, what I like about your question is the term of digital efficiency because um, a lot of the companies in the past few years have been looking about digital transformation and so on, but they don't stop and assess um, the efficiency and the effectiveness of the systems and the things that, and the initiatives and the processes they are changing within the organization. So now we have all forcibly uh, had to stop and uh, put all of this into test, right? So um, you have two categories of organizations, the people who looked at that before and the people who didn't. I think for the people who did, they are now um, either reaping the benefits of what they have invested in in the last few uh, years, uh, they are realizing where the pitfalls are and so on, or they are actually realizing that they have made the wrong investments. They have made, um, um, like they, they have looked at the whole matter in a wrong way. And um, one of the main things for that is the costs, as you said, because um, we have a, a like a lot of people look at uh, digitalization and uh, the integration of digital solutions as just um, some kind of fancy uh, solutions and, and systems integration, where we say we have 17,000 systems and, and, and softwares and so on working in the company while it has a lot of processes change as well. So those processes initially 20, 30 years ago were created because there was only men who can do it or manpower who can do it or or uh, uh, or people with technical experience and there were no computers and then we had the introduction of computers and then we have introduction of newer technologies and this is how things are evolving so at the end of the day to keep the same process and introduce a system this does not lead anywhere it just increase overheads right so you're paying for systems you're paying for people you're paying you you don't have any increase in efficiency so you're not getting more output from the same number of people and this is where we are right now. This is why when we say there is a drop in efficiency because people are working remotely, um, one of the main reasons is because we don't know how to, like, there is a big majority, let's say, not, not all of us, but a lot, a lot of people do not know how to assess the productivity and the efficiency of people who are working remotely. We are relying more or less about the integrity of the people. There are no systems and processes in place, that, uh, especially in construction, because in other industries, this have evolved a while ago. They have had this culture and they have been building on it. But especially in construction, we always had the physical presence 100% at fixed places as one of the core requirements of any project delivery, which is proving right now, like I'm talking with a lot of people and they are like, um, we're talking about quantity surveyors, we're talking about technical and design teams, we're talking about planners, uh, we're talking about uh, um, even quality uh, uh, assurance and quality control people and they are all having the same message of, um, we don't need this number of people on site. Like now they, they realize that it's a safety hazard. They are like, we don't need all of this people on site and we could have made something else work, right? So um, I think all of this together is, uh, um, they are important factors, but coming back to your original part about costing, I think one of the main things that people are going to be discussing in the upcoming period is unnecessary investments. But um, in, in the sense of what we're going through right now, I don't think that investing in getting your uh, business to be more agile and be able to work in with a shared resources concept, because if you have the right digital infrastructure and so on, you can, um, you can actually deliver more with less. So this is one of the main things. So we're not talking only about working remotely. We're talking about shared resources across different business units in a specific portfolio uh, or um, uh, different uh, projects and so on. So these are things that will, I think a lot of people will get to look at in the upcoming period to see their digital efficiency and digital fitness, um, especially in the construction sector. So you think that we will take a lot of opportunity away from this time? We'll, we'll, there, there, will be, there will be so much that we have learned from this moment. Do you think that this has thrust us further into the acceptance of dig digitalization in business? Um, I think it should accelerate a lot. Like um, it, it should accelerate a lot um, the realization of the importance of the digitalization within construction. I think when the upcoming period we're going to see a lot, um, the organizations will have to, um, if, if someone doesn't stop at, the, at what happened in the last two months and think how um, can I, can I change the culture and the processes and the things that, uh, uh, that are actually 
um, the basis of my work or the basis of my operations, then they they wouldn't learn anything from this period. And this is, um, we're already moving into a digital world. Nothing can stop that. This period has just accelerated our understanding of its importance and of how feasible it is. Um, avoiding it and just, you know, uh, uh, and just looking the other side is not going to stop it. it but, but actually capitalizing on its opportunities, it might even accelerate it in an industry that has always been characterized by moving very slowly in this arena. So uh, everything takes a lot of time. Um, mm. So yeah, I think I think it's going to accelerate it massively. To be honest, from my own. Yeah, point. at the beginning of this pandemic, we well before there was a lot of restrictions to voice over IP in the UAE, and we saw the government make some steps to make some change. They did say at that time it would be for a period. Um, do you think? Do you think that this time has changed their opinion? Um, I think from a government perspective, they are going to look at a lot of things in a different way to enable, organize, to empower organizations to be more efficient, more agile, be able to have, uh, again, share resources across their portfolios and avoid uh, some kind of a crisis like the one that happened right now. But also let me tell you before, before the current period, because the, the, the lift of the ban on the void services has mainly uh, was mainly for um, uh, personal use, but because before I was personally using VoIP services through our corporate VPNs and our lease lines uh, in our company networks and so on. So they always understood, like the government has always understood the importance of it from a corporate perspective. And this is why it has always been there just for corporate clients, right? The, 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 the idea of having VoIP for personal use is a completely different discussion. But um, yeah, we have, we have a country here, like if we're talking about specifically here, not the, the Middle East in general, we have very good infrastructure. And I think this is one of the easiest places where a lot of things can move forward in terms of how we change our perception on how to deliver a project. Um, the idea of having manufacturing on site is one thing. Of course, it is uh, something very important to capitalize on, but the idea of how do we deliver the actual project in site without having that much people and the need for physical meetings every day, there is a schedule and, uh, and 17 meeting rooms that are full of people and so on, when, when actually things can, be, can run, be run more efficiently. And I don't want to take it only from a meetings perspective and VoIP and, and, and Microsoft Teams and so on. There is a lot of other things when we talk about quality control, it's not about meeting, it's about their physical presence and on site to be able to check and inspect. But we do have digital solutions that can actually get them to do that remotely. And I think I, talk about, uh, I, I talked about that uh, with you before. Mm -hmm. So there, we can take a look at every, uh, every area in the construction cycle or every phase of the construction cycle and all stakeholders, and we can, we can maximize the benefits of how we can share the resources across the board, how we can use digital, uh, the, our digital platforms to even increase efficiency and to be able to monitor people's productivity, because this is a very important part. People cannot let people work at home and they don't realize what they are actually doing, right? So this is one right, of the right, right, very right. important things. Yeah. Yes, it is, a con it is a concern. I had one more question for you, but I, I think I'm going to leave it for another interview because I'm very curious to see what your take is on the 5G networks. Uh, I know the UAE has been progressing very heavily with that, and yeah. it, it has been a controversial subject. Uh, in, 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 the, in, in around the traps uh, the last couple of weeks, but we'll, we'll leave that for another moment. I think uh, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be talking for too long uh, yeah, on, on that one sure. particular subject. So, yeah, Mama, thank sure. you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Philip. Always good to hear your, uh, your enthusiastic voice. Well, uh, before, we, before we leave, we'd like to go over to have a look to see if there are some questions for our panel. Um, and so, Jay, um, I'm sure that, I'm sure that we have many questions from our audience, but uh, maybe you could sort of take us through some of the questions that uh, you think may be, may be of interest for us to uh, review. Uh, so we have a question from uh, Khaled Rassalan. He's asking what kind of governance and economic measurements do you think should be taken in case of a second wave of coronavirus? Is this taken in consideration in terms of crisis management? Bawan, yes, go ahead. Do you have a comment? Sure. Yeah, I just would say that uh, we, we glanced over the scenario modeling and I would say that this, this is a key for, for this. So as, as doing scenario modeling, one of the scenarios or multiple scenarios should be about the second wave. We've read so much about it. So it depends on the gradual reopening of the economy and you should always have a new scenario modeling key aspects of, of 
what what if the second wave happens uh of course the government will help at the, in that case but what about your internal controls what about your internal measures and how will you be impacted you you shared before that um what we do now in response to this to, to this crisis in our in our business will be will be a, a review of any banking or financial support extended from the banks uh, to us. This is this is part of the criteria of their analysis. I guess what sure. you're saying is this this also needs to be part of that risk assessment. Yes, that's that's one aspect of it. And the second aspect is that the second wave might vary from uh, factory to factory, side to side. Uh, company to company based on the health and safety measures that you take after the gradual reopening. So it might be clustered to your business and then you will have more of a reputational or financial damage than your peers in the industry. So All the more reason for us to, to continue doing what we're doing. So very good. Yeah. I'm very impressed with the construction industry's response to uh, their activity on sites. So that's very good. Uh, Jay, any other, another question? Uh, yeah, we have uh, Mohammed uh, Behnasi. I guess uh, he's asking: uh, Is COVID nineteen? If COVID nineteen is going to stay for a long time, uh, don't we think that we may need to adjust all our design standards and codes of material, etc., to adopt to new sustainable solution, compro compromising between uh, economy and life? I'd, I'd like to have a go, if you don't mind, Phil. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. All right. So. Um, the presence of COVID is going to be, whether it stays with us or not, um, is going to have, uh, um, it's a part of the market and the market decides what it is that we do. We have to, uh, to, to anticipate these changes and it's the, um, it's the suppliers and processors who are working with the broadest section of the supply chain that will help uh, innovate new, new products if indeed they're required in the first place. So if there are the suppliers who are uh, and, and processors who are uh, sensitive to what the market wants and are willing to work with just about everybody involved in the manufacturing process, the, the building of the buildings from design, from concept right to delivery, including, including facilities maintenance. If, um, if all of these people work together in a holistic way, uh, in a multidisciplinary way, then um, of course, we would we would we respond to, to that. Of course, it can't be done by a, a processor alone or a supplier alone. It requires the um, uh, the participation of, of all of the stakeholders, um, and that's um, that's how we're going to supply, uh, respond to this. If indeed the COVID uh, situation um, persists, if it if it sustains, uh, because people are are the market and. We still want to live a good life. And if it means that we have to live a good life in the presence of, of, of COVID, well, we're going to figure out a way to do it. Very good answer. Jay, one more question before we finish, because uh, we, uh, we did say that we'd, we'd conclude by, by uh, 3.15, and uh, we want to keep true to that. It's been a very good webinar, lots of good interaction. Jay, uh, one more question. Give us a call. Yeah, Ivan. so there's a question. Uh, if the subcontractor or supplier cannot offer further discounts since already squeezed our contractors, will to change uh, suppliers or continue with them? Uh, let, be, before we have a comment the, on this, I, I was just scanning through some of the questions and uh, there's, there's a significant amount of comment from our audience simply saying that there is a lot of pressure to reduce price, even now, even on the projects for supply. And uh, I, I, th I think when, when we hear the contractor saying that they're contractually bound, when we're hearing the developer saying that, the, the, the architect saying that they're still holding as, as well as to specification as they can, a, a lot of this price request comes from the supply chain to that project, people looking for some value or for some support. But in this particular case, the question is with regard to the supply of subcontract or supplier, um, uh, Jay, just, just read through that question one more time and uh, whoever jumps in first can answer it because it's a good question. Uh, if the subcontractor or supplier cannot offer further discounts since already squeezed are the contractors, will to change suppliers or continue with them if the client is uh, asking for huge discounts? Are we prepared to, to move away to, an, to another supplier? We did discuss this a little bit, but uh, does anyone have any comment? Bashir, Jonathan? Yeah, can I, can I answer or can uh, I try to answer? 
Please uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I, I have to say uh, this situation is not new. Uh, it has happened in 2008. Um, uh, we have experienced clients uh, requesting a reduction in prices in 2008 while uh, during the crisis. The only significant difference, uh, it's a main significant difference, is that in 2008 the price levels were much higher and much more healthier than the price levels that are already uh, in place now or currently in place now. So it's not about uh, what happens if it's about the ability of the contractors and subcontractors to offer discounts. Yes, there are uh, there are uh, cases. Uh, we are living a case. Uh, I'm not going to mention the, the name of the job of the client, but but we are living a case where clients like a client have asked for a significant reduction in in, in price, a, a job which is ongoing. It is not possible for many contractors or for the majority of the contractors and subcontractors at this moment in time to respond positively to this. We did respond positively to this in 2008, a lot of us. Yeah? And we have probably converted uh, a lot of cost plus uh, 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 single source contracts into lump sums with reduction in prices because we were able to do that. But today, I don't see many or any of the main contractors or subcontractors able to respond positively to these requests, unfortunately. Very good, very good. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, uh, for joining us as our uh, panel of uh, industry leaders. Your contribution to our webinar has been tremendously appreciated by all of us here at Ventures On Site and Construction Technology Forum. Um, it's been a very good webinar. We will stay true to our uh, commitment to conclude, conclude this uh, no later than, uh, than this time. Um, for all that have joined us, we thank you so much for joining us in our webinar. I see that we have um, only touched on so many of the questions that you've raised. Sorry if we did not get a chance to get back to you, but uh, I, I, I look through the, the questions. I think there's almost 60, 70, 80 questions uh, here. I, I just, uh, we, we would be here until six o'clock tonight uh, uh, answering them, which I personally wouldn't mind doing, but uh, we do need, to, uh, we do need to, to keep active in business. We'll, we'll review your questions and we'll send you an answer um, and uh, help you understand uh, as much as, as we can, as much information as we can provide. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for our webinar today. Um, we commit to continue uh, in, in bringing you good content that will help in your business. Um, from all of us at Ventures On Site, uh, allow me to say thank you so much for joining us and we wish you um, to uh, be safe at this time and uh, we hope this webinar has helped you stay informed so you stay competitive. Thank you very much.